G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and I'd like to give Chime a big shout out for sponsoring this episode. So, no one likes waiting on a paycheck when the bills are coming in. I've had times in the past when the bills just keep piling up and I kept checking my accounts nervously so that I didn't incur any late fees. Well, the good news is that now you can get your paycheck up to two days earlier with direct deposits with Chime. That's up to two more days to save, pay bills, and generally feel better about your money situation. And Chime is more than just about getting paid early. It's also an award-winning mobile app, checking account, debit card, and optional savings account. So, what are you waiting for? Hopefully, not your paycheck. Get started with Chime today. Applying for a free account takes less than two minutes. Get started at chime.com forward slash be scared. That's chime.com forward slash be scared. And in the spirit of transparency, just know that banking services and debit card is provided by the Bancor Bank or Stride Bank, NA, members FDIC. And early access to direct deposit funds depends on the payer. I was in juvie as a kid pretty often. I ended up doing four months out of the six month sentence for possession with intent to distribute and probation violation which was the longest that I'd gone to the juvie. Ghost stories have been shared amongst the kids in there fairly often. The DOs, detention officers, would chime in time to time to tell theirs as well. Some were pretty hard to buy because it's juvenile and there isn't much to do besides tell stories, especially when talking through vents and toilets. But one night, it was time for lockdown, bedtime, so we all turned in our stuff and headed in our cells. This time of night, someone is usually talking to you through a vent, so we'd stay up a little bit after lockdown, unless you were tired. Sometimes, we'd just mess around and even holler out the cell door saying insults to one another or egging on the DOs to come into the pod just to annoy them. And this night, we honestly thought that someone was just messing around again. Because we hear what sounds like wailing, like someone pretending to be in pain echoing through a cell door and so a lot of the kids were yelling for them to shut up and banging on the cell doors to get them to stop. A lot of threats were thrown out towards whoever was making the noise. But then, the wailing sounded like someone was actually in pain, guttural moaning and groaning, sounds you would hear from someone dying perhaps, absolutely terrifying to hear. I started to get chills down my back because it sounded unreal. Finally though, the DOs came in and turned on the lights and started calling out for whoever it was seeing as someone sounded like they needed medical assistance. They opened all of the doors and told us all to step out so they could figure out who needs help. But the sound kept going, even after we all stepped out and lined up downstairs. The sound seemed to be coming from the second level, from a cell that no one was inside of. Two DOs went up and opened the door and the wailing kept going. The DOs radioed it in saying that there's nobody in the cell and that they were openly talking about how creeped out they were. And then a DO rushed down the stairs and told another DO that we all needed to leave the pot. We grabbed our blankets and moved to the pot across the way. All the while this wailing was continuing. It was genuinely like something out of a horror movie. Now, while we were waiting in the other pod for new cells to be assigned, the lights in the pod that we were in had started to flicker. The look of horror on the kids' faces and the faces of the DOs sent goosebumps over my entire body as we were all witnessing this. One DO even told us that we needed to pray, so we all grabbed hands and began praying. Kids that hated each other were grabbing hands and praying. That's how wild this was. Eventually, we were all sent into our new cells and down for the night. The next morning, we were telling all the kids in the new pod about what happened, and they were really shook. One DO had told us, him and the other DOs, had seen a, a black-figured cloak floating around in the pod around midnight, stopping at different cells. 
We never got moved back into that pod the rest of the time that we were there. I saw that they ended up making it a rec room for the blue shirts, the kids with more privileges because of good behavior, the last time that I was around there, anyway. When I was 10, I was riding my bike home from a friend's house when I encountered something. I live far north and it was mid-December, so we were about halfway through the three-month blackout. It was dark 24 hours a day. It was late afternoon, but if it wasn't for the streetlights that lined every street, I wouldn't have been able to see a thing. I had to pedal slow because I was bundled up in not only my heavy clothes, but also my windproof coveralls, because we were pre-blizzard. I stopped halfway up the hill that led to my street to take a puff of my inhaler and rest my legs. After my breathing slowed, I was able to hear a, a panting sound behind me, I thought. I turned around, expecting to see Petey, the coyote hybrid stray that was basically owned by the entire town. He was super friendly and was known to check on children when they were outside on their own. But Petey wasn't there. Thinking that my hearing was still a, a little fuzzy due to an inner ear infection that I had just gotten over, I shrugged it off and dismounted my bike. It was easier to walk alongside it at this point, and as I was nearing my street, I felt a, a hot breath on the small bit of ankle that was exposed between my overalls and rolled down socks. Immediately, I stopped and looked around again. I was raised by a very superstitious family, my pawpaw always says, if something seems to be a little off, then you're not perceptive enough. After a moment of surveying my surroundings, I saw a four-legged form sort of trotting up the street behind me. It was too small to be Petey, but too thin to be a wolf or a lost hunting dog, so I began moving again, realizing that this was not an animal that I could predict. I kept my eyes on it and walked slow, just in case it was a very malnourished wolf that was looking for something to eat. It was only when I turned slowly onto my street that the animal started walking quickly. Its movements were so strange though and it made sort of grunting noises that almost sounded human I guess. When it suddenly began running, I pushed my bike back towards it and dashed up the hill towards my house. Our street was essentially a dirt road that turned into our driveway. The dirt was muddy from melted snow and I kept slipping. Rocks cut my hands from stopping myself from hitting the ground and my tiny ankles kept rolling. At one point, I couldn't catch myself in time and ended up sliding a few feet downhill. That's when I felt a searing pain on the back of my left leg. I cried out and rolled over to kick the animal off of me. That was also when I got a good look at my attacker. It was definitely a canine of some kind, but strangely it didn't have any hair. Its skin looked like black metal under the flickering streetlight overhead. I didn't get a good full look at it though because I immediately began kicking at it with the leg that wasn't pinned by its paws and teeth. Two good strikes to its side had it whimpering and jumping back just enough for me to scramble to my feet and begin running again. I could feel blood rolling down my leg as my house came into view. I could still hear the dog growling as it sprinted after me. I screamed for my mums as I approached the front porch, praying that they were home and that their guns were nearby. Aga opened the door less than a moment after hearing my shouts. She says that all she saw was me half running, half crawling sort of up the driveway, and that was all it took for her to run outside in her pajamas and bare feet. She heard a, a sort of howling noise as she picked me up and ran back up the steps. We got inside, just as Katie was running out of the den with her 50-year-old AR-7. The rifle only worked like 40% of the time, but it was the only weapon that wasn't locked up in their bedroom closet. I wrapped my arms and legs around Aga and buried my face in her neck, sobbing violently. She could feel the warm blood from my leg against her back and she immediately rushed into the kitchen to call Katie's mother, Mary. She was staying at my Aunt Gloria's house. She was a nurse and she would be better than any doctor or shaman in town. Grammarie, which is what I called her at the time, 
could hear my cries in the receiver and immediately got moving. Gloria, like everyone else in my family, lived on the same property, so it wouldn't take her long. Katie came in after about 10 minutes of scanning the perimeter of the house. She was soaked from the sleet that had started falling and her hands were freezing when she ran in and started examining my face and neck. By then, Arger had gotten me to sit on the large ironwood dining room table and they worked together to get the several layers of clothing removed from my stiff body. I was still in shock and couldn't really assist them in the painstaking process. Grandma Marie and Gloria arrived just as they were getting me down to my long johns. Glory had called my Uncle Cal and Pawpaw before they left her house. I remember hearing this too and just feeling a, a relief unlike any other. In my mind, they were and still are the strongest men in the world. If something hurt me, they would make sure that it would never come here again. The four women, though, panicked when they saw the source of all the blood that I had lost. There were five large gashes, about five inches long, and each one being about half an inch wide. Luckily, Grammarie essentially had everything that she needed to treat the wounds, but she was adamant about getting me a tetanus and rabies vaccine, ASAP. Cal and Paw Paw gathered a posse and the large group combed the woods and streets of the town. There was a lockdown due to the possibility of this being a rabid animal. Everyone stayed inside for nearly 24 hours until the men were able to confirm the coast was clear. Whatever had attacked me, it was gone now. Now, when I was finally cleaned up with a drain put in my wounds, Cal sat down beside me on my parents' bed and asked me to recall everything that happened leading up to the attack. He asked if I had remembered smelling salt water, if I remember seeing poor poor prints, fading on the asphalt or anything, if I remembered hearing chains rattling or stuff like this. Honestly, until he started asking me all of this, I didn't really entertain the idea that this was supernatural. I thought it was just a, a sickly wolf or a coyote who wanted to claim one more victim before going into the woods to die. Pawpaw drew up some sketches for me though and asked if any of them looked like what attacked me. When I pointed out the one that most resembled the hairless beast, he immediately kissed me and he hugged me close. My pawpaw is a, a very stoic Inuit man who never physically showed affection, so this was really strange to say the least. But my mums tell me that when I was a baby, he only held me a handful of times and it was always stiff. He loved me and they assured me of that, but he would never tell me as such. So, when he pulled away from the embrace and stroked my hair with tears in his eyes, I became weirdly afraid. I remember asking him if I needed to go to the hospital and his small chuckle in response. Without a word, he left, leaving Arga to assure me that I wouldn't be crossing the pearly gates anytime soon. I learned later though that in the 1950s, Paw had a friend that went by the name of Howdy. He was also Inuit and the two of them had basically grown up together. When they were both 15, Paw Paw had joined Howdy on a hunting trip about 100 miles north of our property. This took place during the blackout as well, and as they trekked through the thick brush of the tundra, Paw Paw could remember seeing Howdy about 5 feet ahead of him, but suddenly, he just wasn't there anymore. There was a howl, a scream, and a growl before the overgrowth to Paw Paw's right began to rustle violently. Before he could react, it just went completely silent. He found Howdy's body about 10 yards away from the path. He was mauled and mangled to the point of being pretty much unrecognizable. But Pawpaw knew that it was his buddy. It took him two days to carry Howdy back to his truck so that he could drive him home. And throughout the arduous hike, Pawpaw could see large paw prints in the mud ahead of him. Each time he drew closer, they would disappear and... When he was finally to the truck and setting Howdy up in the bed of it, he saw what he knew was responsible for ending his friend's life. A keylet. Something he'd only read about was pacing the edge of the trail watching Paw Paw with small but piercing eyes. Not unlike the legends of other black dogs, these are large and black, and in this case hairless, canines that were known to attack travelers and kill them. 
From the legends told in our village, it was rare to survive an encounter with one of these things, but those who did immediately went mad. As far as I know, I never went mad. Surprisingly too, my wound healed in practically no time and the only thing that I had left of the encounter were horrific nightmares, a fear of the blackout, and a few scars. Aga maintains that despite a disturbing life on our property, the most traumatizing thing that she's ever experienced was watching me scramble helplessly up our muddy driveway. She says that the screams that tore through my throat were what she imagined perhaps a, a damned spirit would sound like. I truly feel like I'm just going insane. This has been occurring for months now and what began as slight anxiety is now intense paranoia. You see, every night I hear my cat outside my window crying. Not meowing, but crying. Cat owners will understand what I mean. The first night, I walked outside without hesitation and called my cat. When that didn't work, I worried that his legs or paws may have been hurt, which would explain the crying. So I went and searched for him with my phone flashlight. That detail is important because, as you probably know, phone flashlights are not that bright. So when I saw something moving in the bushes... It was impossible to tell if it was my cat or not. What I do know is that when I gave up and chalked his behavior up to being a brat, because let's be real, what cat comes when they're called, right? And it's no stretch for him to whine for no reason. I walked back inside my house to find my cat curled up and sleeping on my couch. Now, there's just no way that he somehow got past me walking through the door without my knowledge. But still, I brushed it off because I suppose anything is possible, right? The next night it happened was about a week later and by then I had forgotten about the first weird experience. Only when I looked to the foot of my bed and remembered my cat had been with me the entire time, it all of a sudden came rushing back. I'm the girl who makes fun of horror movie characters for being so stupid, so when I sort of walked outside in morbid curiosity, let me honestly tell you that I have never retrospectively hated myself more. I went to my window and the crying was so clear that it had to be coming from within a few feet, but I didn't see anything, which was strange because I definitely saw something the first night. It was around this time that the creepiness of it all really hit me and I all but ran back inside. I swore then that my cat had lost his nighttime privileges and would be indoors by sundown and I wouldn't be investigating this anymore, naively thinking that it would just go away. But it has just gotten way worse. That was months ago and the crying occurs almost nightly now. Barring a couple of nights of feline rebellion, I've been vigilant about keeping him indoors at night, so I know for a fact that whatever I'm hearing is definitely not my cat, but it sounds just like him, and it's so realistic. Now, before you comment saying that it was another cat, don't bother. I know what my cat sounds like. I'm a proud cat mum, and I can tell him apart from any neighborhood stray, I'm familiar with being cautious of baby cries outside your door at night because predators have been known to record them and bait women, essentially weaponizing their maternal instinct. But who does that with a cat? For that to work, not only would you have to know that I have a cat, but also somehow gain access to a recording of his crying and play it back for me every night right outside of my window and not be seen. So, hello nightmare, right? Has anyone else experienced something similar? How did you make it stop? Is this thing's goals just to rob me of sleep and peace of mind? Or am I in danger here? Or is it finally time for me to suck up my pride and see somebody because I'm officially going insane? I 
Grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania with a dense forest in my backyard, as well as a creek and fresh water spring too. My brother and I would often play away our summers in the woods running around, but we both can attest to having some uh, weird experiences. Nothing super overt, but just sort of your stereotypical chills or uneasy feeling as if you're being watched. However, when I was around 13 and my brother was 15, we went into the woods like we always did and at some point we sort of split off. I travelled about maybe a mile along the creek when I heard my brother call for me. There was no panic in his voice, it was super calm just as if he wanted to talk to me about something or if he found something cool, a rock or a critter or something. I called back asking what he wanted but his response was just my name again and again. I began to walk toward the direction of his voice deeper in the woods, away from the creek and into the brush. I continued calling out again, asking what he wanted but his response was always just my name in the same tone and pitch. Then, suddenly, someone grabbed my shoulder and when I turned, it was my brother. I asked him what he needed and he looked at me confused. You were calling me, so I came to find you, he said. I responded that he had been the one calling for me and I was walking to him. He said that he hadn't called for me at all at this point and I pointed to the direction that I had heard his voice and he responded that he had never even gone in that direction, keeping to the creek side like I had. I was inclined to believe him too as I had heard his voice come from deep in the woods where there was thick brush filled with thorn bushes and not many walkable deer trails and he had approached me from behind which was the direction of the creek. My brother and I decided that we were going to head in for the day after this experience and we avoided the woods for months after this too. It's by far the creepiest experience that I've ever had. A few years back, I went camping with two buddies in the mountains near Lake Tahoe. We hiked about two hours with our packs to a, a small lake and set up camp. All was normal during the day and we made some hot dogs and beans. Then we stayed up until it was dark to watch the stars at night. Once it was dark, we hiked up to the top of a, a large boulder to sort of get a bit of a vantage point to see the stars over the trees. I recall that there was no moon out that night because we could see the stars so clearly due to the limited ambient light. And we were pretty far out so there's no background noise or light from humans. And once your eyes adjusted, after maybe half an hour or so, we could see all the stars and even some satellites slowly moving in the sky. It's very dark out without the moon and that will be important later so keep it in mind. So... After we're done stargazing, we head down to our tents set up right by the lake. We have two two-person tents for the three of us. My two friends shared one tent and I was alone in the other one. We set up the tents right next to each other in the same flat spot. I fall asleep pretty easily because I was tired from hiking and exploring all day and because it was so dark. I like sleeping in the dark though. However, at about maybe three or four in the morning... I wake up to a rustling noise outside of my tent. In my half sort of asleep days, I'm really not sure if it's just wind or something else. I keep listening and I realize that it's something brushing against my tent and it sounds like maybe an animal is pushing its nose against the tent fabric and sniffing. The sound is coming from the side of the tent right next to my head so I can hear it super clearly. At this point, my heart is racing and I'm lying frozen in my sleeping bag hoping that whatever is outside will leave my tent and it'll be over quickly. I think about calling out to my friends in their tent but I don't want to startle or anger whatever is outside so I decide to just keep lying still and hope that it will leave. My mind is going through every possibility and then I finally realize what it is. When we had set up our tents earlier in the day, there wasn't much flat space so we placed our tents very close to each other. 
Evidently, they were so close that when my friend was moving his feet in his sleeping bag, they brushed up against his tent, all which was right near my head. So all along it was my friend's feet moving around and there was no animal or person outside. That was a huge relief. However, the weird stuff doesn't stop there and I only realized that this next part was weird once we had left the next day and I got home. You see, as I laid in my tent and tried to slow my heart after realizing the rustling was just my friend, I was looking at the shadows of the trees on the walls of my tent. But that reminded me, of, sort of as a kid, when a car would slowly drive down your street and the headlights through the blinds could cast shadow that slowly draw across your ceiling. At the time, it made sense to me and I thought it was just like when I was a kid. Considering that I had just thought a, a creature was outside my tent, this seemed like nothing. However, as I mentioned earlier, it was completely dark and moonless. So, what could that light have been? It was a, a very slow drawing light that had the shadows of the trees moving slowly across my tent walls for about five minutes. We were really far from civilization, so there is no way that it was a car or flashlight from a midnight hiker because the light was so steady and slow moving. Could it have been a flare in the sky or a comet streaking across the dark, starry sky? I suppose so, but really, I don't think it was that. I mean, something that far away really doesn't seem to account for the strength in the shadows if you catch my drift. In any case, I still don't know what it could have been and I only ever realized it after that I had gotten home and left the campsite that that night was a really weird one. This has been going on for a couple of years now, but it hasn't gotten to me until now. I work as a paddling coach in Ottawa, Canada. I coach sprint kayak and canoe, dragon boat, stand-up paddleboard, and an assortment of other boats. I work year-round, but when the water opens up, I work out of a camp 10 minutes outside of the city. The club is surrounded by deep woods and several other camps. The plot of the land next to where I work is owned by the YMCA and used for a summer camp, but the camp only takes about a quarter of the area. The rest of the forest is filled with a, a spider web of deep wood trails that go on for like kilometers. I used to train my athletes on the trails, but for a couple of years now we haven't been allowed to use them. Anytime we go on the trails now, a representative of the YMCA usually comes and kicks us off. So... It all started about two years ago. I was upriver, a ways coaching a dragon boat session. We were paddling alongside the shoreline owned by the YMCA and just as we were taking a break, I heard the most chilling scream coming from the woods, not too far from the shore. It sounded like a woman's, but it sounded really off as though she was struggling to get air or something. The whole boat stopped moving and stopped to listen. It was quiet for a long time until... I asked if anyone had heard that. A dragon boat holds 22 people and just as I asked, everyone looked at me and nodded. But people were quiet for a while to see if it would happen again. This first incident happened late in the summer so I assumed that it was just a camp kid screaming at a bug or something. I mean, it happens. But when we didn't hear it again, we decided to continue the workout. Just as we got going, however, it happened again. Still, the same gargled sort of scream just beyond the tree line. And again, everyone in the boat stopped to listen. I wasn't 100% sure what to do, to be honest. I mean, I had never dealt with anything like this before. It was one of those things that you question constantly, not sure if what you heard was legit or not. I beached the dragon boat on shore just so that we could take a look. Everyone was guessing that the source of the scream could be more than beyond the tree line. A couple of guys and me took a look around but couldn't see anything. It was honestly a really chilling situation. We all eventually decided to call it a day though and head back. I assumed it was just a campground hiking the trails and it eventually left my mind. Flash forward to last summer though and I heard the screams again, only a handful of times though, over the season. I can't say how many times but 
It couldn't have been more than three. Each time it would happen, me and whoever I was with could never find where it was coming from though. It was always the stretch of beach owned by the YMCA, never anywhere else. This all happened over different points of the summer and it was never just one part of the season. I want to say that this wasn't the only weird stuff that was going on at that club. Besides the odd disembodied screaming, myself and others would hear a few different sounds coming from the woods by the club. This would include a, a weird sort of rasping wind blowing through the forest, immediately followed by the sound of what can only be described as someone gutting a fish, but really loudly. It's really hard to explain, but I want to do the sound justice because it just has chilled me to the bone every time that I've heard it. But the worst thing that I've experienced at work is somewhat too common nowadays. It usually happens when I have my younger training group with me. With this group, I coach mostly sprint canoe and sprint kayak and the group ranges in age from the youngest being 12 to the oldest being 17. I train the kids after school and sometimes we go late to just before the sun sets. Sometimes I'm stuck closing up the club in the dark with the kids which is when this usually happens too. From time to time when it's just on the cusp of being dark out, me and my athletes hear footsteps coming from the woods that surround us. They always just stop short of the tree line and it doesn't sound like someone running through the trails or anything but as if someone is walking through the underbrush. Just as we hear it, me and the kids always fall silent and look to the exact same place. This usually prompts everyone to drop whatever they're doing and hightail it to the parking lot to drive off. Now, all of this would have been fine. I mean, I'm a pretty tough guy I guess, I don't scare easy, at least I didn't think so. But a couple of days ago, something finally put me over the edge. You see, it's been an exceptionally warm spring in Canada, which has allowed me to start work on the water three to four weeks earlier than usual. I was out on the water with the Dragon Boat crew, and we were paddling up and down the range of beach owned by the YMCA. And again, it happened. Everyone stopped paddling and just sort of stared at the, the stretch of beach that we always do. But the scream sounded different now. Still female, but the best way to describe it is really demonic. All of my hair stood on end. The whole boat laughed awkwardly assuming that it was just a, a member of the club or a member of the YMCA hiking the old trails, but I, I didn't laugh. It hit me almost immediately. It couldn't have been a member of our club because I was the last booking of the night. And it couldn't have been any of the members of the YMCA because it was too early in the season. The, the YMCA camp hasn't been opened for the season yet. That was the other night and quite honestly, I haven't decided what to do yet. But the whole thing has put me on edge and I haven't allowed myself to stay later than 8 these last couple of days. I'm certainly not a usual on these sorts of uh, channels I guess you could say but... I thought that I needed to get my story out there. It isn't just me either. I've talked to the other coaches at the club and all of them have heard the screams. We all just don't know what to do about it to be honest. The screams usually happen a couple of times a summer and usually in twos so I'll try to get a video of it happening if I can and I'll share it with you guys. Anyway, thanks for listening and uh, uh, do wish me the best as... I don't know what to do now.